Welcome to the HR Resource Podcast, a series designed specifically for business owners and executives who want to better understand people to increase productivity and performance. Hi, I'm David Lord, and in this HR Resource Broadcast, we meet the Managing Director of Ipsos Mori's Public Affairs Division, Kelly Beaver. I had a fascinating discussion with Kelly, somebody who's responsible for meeting with government ministers on a regular basis, and has a team of some 250 staff working on some essential projects right now, not least those that are involved directly in COVID-19. So I'd like you to join me in this discussion and learn a little bit more about somebody who gives a very frank, honest, and open appraisal of what it's like to manage an organization in a time of global crisis. I'm delighted to welcome to the HR Source podcast, Kelly Beaver. Hello, um, David. Kelly, I understand, I mean, the area in which you work, you're an expert in crafting questions to elicit uh, the desired reply. Certainly your organisation is as well. So you're going to be kind to me, I hope, in terms of some of the awkwardness of my questions. So I'm going to get a really clumsy one out of the way first, which is, um, how's COVID been for you? How have the last six months been? From a personal perspective, from a business perspective, well, from a personal perspective, it has been very difficult to not see the team of people that I work with. We're a very, uh, very close team, even though we've 250, we're very, very close as a team. So that's been very difficult. Um, and from a home perspective as well, in particular the May period where there was no uh, childcare, no schools, that was very tricky. So I think we've had some dark times. We saw a bit of the light over the summer and I did enjoy the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, despite what people say it has managed to generate after that. Um, and now we're looking into the sort of winter of relative discontent again, um, which will be challenging for all of us, I'm sure. So not did, looking forward to that. Did you find working from home, you, you could be more productive or with, with the childcare issues, that hints that perhaps you, you had your hands full? Well, just for the month of May, when we had no schools operating, I think for everybody who had children, I think they were facing some of the darkest times out of all people in the pop British population. That was particularly challenging. Once the kids are back in school, I think working from home has certainly got its highlights. And, um, you know, the lack of an hour and a half commute one way and an hour and a half commute back is certainly one of those highlights. But you do miss the people. And I think working from home for too long in isolation from all of your colleagues, it's not a recipe for a, a highly productive, um, innovative, creative business. So I think uh, in the longer term, I'd love to be back in the office a couple of days a work week with yeah, colleagues. I would agree. I think the interaction with people is something that, that, that we, we do miss. I mean, I had one of my first real engagements as a business meeting um, actually quite recently. And um, I was surprised to hear the person that I was meeting who actually runs a very, very involved business that was his first meeting yeah. somebody. And whilst we're in the meeting, there's somebody in a, in a, in a high vis jacket walking around with a clipboard, mm. just checking to make sure that everybody's safely... Not too close. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's another world. Kelly, you have a very impressive CV, very interesting, which obviously leans to very much the fact that you love data and, and people. Mm. Is, that, is that how you... Are those two factors correct? Is that, is that the right to draw that conclusion? And is that how you manage to find yourself in this particular field? Oh, that's an interesting question. So I'm actually not a social researcher by background. I'm an economist who happens to be what my husband calls more of a socio-economist or somebody who's not a proper economist because I do. <laughs> well, look, for, for in a in world of economics, things do become very black and white. And actually what I enjoy is more the gray bit in the middle where you need a lot more knowledge and evidence to be able to interpret what's happening. And that's where the love of understanding how people think, feel, how their attitudes and behaviors change, um, that's where that bit comes in. Um, and I started out life looking at government policies and seeing how effective they were, how impactful they were to achieve particular objectives. And from there, I've just grown a love of all things data, research, um, from the more traditional methods like big face-to-face -face surveys, right through to some of the more innovative methods that we do, which are like neuro neurological testing to understand how people react to certain stimulus and some really wow. interesting, yeah, drones, fleets of drones, which do geo surveillance work to understand how populations are moving in dis you know, displaced areas. 
So I think there's lots of really interesting things and re the research field is ever evolving. Um, and that's why, I guess that's why Ipsos Mori is a, an interesting place to work now for somebody with my kind of background. Would you say Ipsos, is, is, Ipsos Mori is the global leader? In, in well, we are the most innovative company in the world as by the GRIT um, book that tells you who the most innovative company is. And we've been that way, I think this is the last, this is the last two years. And for big companies, that's really hard. It's often small, little entrepreneurial companies that you would perceive as quite- More agile, you'd think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would often think that they would be more innovative, but actually our scale and our infrastructure gives us the ability to be more innovative and to trial things. And not everything will work. Uh, not everything will work in every geography either. Like in the UK, we do not have a fleet of drones. Um, in America, that kind of thing is much more okay, actually. Um, so being able to gather data about population movement and uh, asset ownership through survey, like geospatial evidence is something that they do do there. But for us in the UK, that thing would be a privacy issue. So, yeah. um, so not every technology and not any, every innovation works in every context. So what, for our particular audience, obviously from, a, from looking at from a, a commercial perspective and um, with maybe a, an HR bias, but, but or yes. in, particularly with internal perhaps focus in their, in their organisations and also the impact of those organisations externally. What innovations or what's happening at, uh, at Ipsos Mori that, that you perhaps want to share with us today? Rather, not from the research side, but from a business side? Yes. Or what, yeah, business side. Um, well, I think everybody's had to innovate over the last six months. Um, working from home wasn't a particular innovation for us. Uh, many of us were doing that already. Um, I guess some of the things that we've been trying to do in order to stimulate some of the creativity and the innovation that an at-home environment is create, um, it's not very innovative, David, if I'm honest, it's sort of reward packages for people where you know they demonstrate that they can do something um, particularly excellent around a new innovation and we will fund that innovation. We've got methodology funds to help stimulate research method innovation. We've got tech funds and those kind of things at a time when you can't see your colleagues face to face, encourage that level of interaction and some kind of innovation when you're sitting on your own in your house, staring at your laptop on another Zoom call. As, as the pandemic, has COVID actually created greater demand for your services? Than, than uh, on some your... bits of the business. So we are a big, broad business. Ipsos Mori works with private companies and with the public sector. And the bit I'm accountable for is largely the bit that works with the public sector. But I have a small, um, a smaller business that does work on corporate reputation for organisations like Shell, um, etc. So, um, and I would say on the government side, absolutely. Governments are availing of services at the minute and they really need help because they're not just dealing with the pandemic, they're also in the UK dealing with Brexit. There's a new government in town as from the end of December last year, and they brought that manifesto with them about leveling up um, in, in the regions, and they have quite a lot to do. And as a result, they are needing research, insight, evaluation, advisory services, of which we offer all. Now, in, it's, uh, just leading on to the public affairs work that you do and working with um, the government, UK government, so you'll be, you'll be dealing with government ministers, civil servants, maybe the odd chief advisor occasionally. Um, <laughs> who specifically briefs you in terms of the, the projects that you're working on? Where does that so it really, it really does depend on the nature of the project and who is the sponsor within a government department or within a ministerial uh, group for the project. So um, some of the stuff that we're doing at the minute, which is around um, testing to understand levels of prevalence of the virus in the population, also levels of antibodies, uh, is with the Department of Health. That will be briefed by a minister, it will be briefed by a director within a particular uh, testing surveillance stream, um, and then it will be managed as well by often a deputy director within the department. So there's a whole tier there and you report at each tier. So it depends. Sometimes it's uh, commissioning by a policy team lead within a government department and sometimes it is actually the ministers are much more involved, very hands-on at the minute as well. The ministerial uh, teams are very hands-on and working incredibly hard. It's a lot of work to be done. I mean, in terms of the in terms of the briefing, once that's been delivered and, and, and tweaked, I presume that there's refining. You then undertake 
the work presumably do you want to just walk me through that that process without obviously Cycle. confidentiality issues but it's just in very broad terms how that would yeah, work yeah no so often our work will come out to tender so we will receive an invitation to tender and we will respond to that invitation to tender with a proposal with the costings and the technical assessment of how the work can be conducted with a team that we think would be best placed to do that and we sell the CVs of our people. So our people are incredibly important. We don't make widgets. We sell people their skills, their expertise, but also their way of dealing with other people. Um, and that's something that we pride ourselves on as an organization. It is that interaction, that relationship with the, uh, the client at the other side. Um, and then we, we put that proposal in. They consider it alongside other proposals, whether it is cost effective, technically proficient. And if we score well, then we secure that contract. And then we deliver it to the best of our ability. We gather feedback throughout the process to make sure people are getting what they need from us. But because we're independent, it's not about making people happy. It's about doing a really thorough, good professional job. And sometimes the outcomes from our research are not the answer that people were hoping for when we were originally commissioned. Um, but we're, we're not here to give you know, the most exciting answer necessary that would suit their purposes. We're here to give an independent assessment, judgment and response, which is what we do. And do you, and members of your team, I'm presuming, and, and perhaps yourself, do you get involved in, in actually translating the output from those briefs back to the ministerial level within the government? Yeah, so often, again, if it, if, it, if it is a minister's, um, if the minister is very close to the commission, then you will be asked to brief either the SPADs or the minister themselves on the outcomes from the project. Um, or you'll be asked to go in and deliver if you're doing a range of things in a particular thematic area. So we do an awful lot in with HMRC, DWP. And if you're doing a lot there, you would either go in and deliver that en masse as a, a full suite uh, and, and deliver that information on you know, what you find around universal credit or what you find on the job retention scheme um, in more of a packaged way. Um, and again, it just depends on the level of involvement from the ministerial teams um, as opposed to the policy teams who on every occasion you're delivering, you're delivering those, those messages. Do you, I mean, one of the things that obviously must be a challenge right now is the amount of noise, the amount of news that is, is literally bombarding us on every front, you know, by the time you've managed to get through the COVID piece of the news at 10, you know, you're practically ready for the weather. Yes. Um, and that's, that's a channel, we've had that now for months. I mean, in relation to the, the data that you are collecting, delivering for the government, how, how are you able, are you able to work with them to assist in trying to sort of get that story broadcast in a much more meaningful, impactful way? Yeah, well, a couple of things just to your question. So firstly, coronavirus has dominated the news, as you've rightly said, since March. Um, and we've never seen anything as high. And we, we track what public are concerned and worried about. And we track that every month for the last 50 years. So we've got a huge data set there. We've never seen anything spike like coronavirus. But other things are now coming to the fore and they are rising. So things like Brexit, changes and concerns around the economy, etc. So the public's bandwidth for something other than coronavirus that is improving okay. and alongside the research that we do for government for third um, third sector organizations for international organizations we also have a communications um, a, a communications and a graphic design component to the work that we do as well so um, either we work with them and it's part of the job to get the messages that the research generates into the public domain and so we would work with uh, broadcast media um the news we do press releases on a daily basis for whatever work that we're producing um but sometimes we do our own work as well so ipsos mori we also do our own thought leadership work our own research for the general public and that's the stuff that we also put out into the media for as a public good rather yeah. than for any commercial gain and do you find that because of the you're, you're assisted with the the weight of the brand and recognition of who you are that manages to cut through quite a bit of the the background noise in the media yeah well, we've got we, good relationships with with the, the main the mainstream media yeah so we're very well known for what is a very small part of our business which is political polling that is less than one percent of our business on an election oh, wow. year it's tiny it's tiny it's a really small part of the business overall but it has the biggest impact on our reputation so when we do political polling which we do every single month um, we put that out through our partnerships with the media 
and that is a public good piece. We do that. We, we look at the leadership. We look at how the public are feeling about the parties and their performance about particular issues. And we track voting intention in the run ups to elections as well. So but it is minus, you know, in, in non-election years, it's less than one percent of the business, substantively so. Do you think there's a possibility that people are losing trust in opinion polls? So I've heard this many times over the years, and as have the, my predecessors in, in roles like this, and there are always going to be, um, there are always going to be those kind of questions when opinion polls are used as predictions, which they are not. They are not predictions. Opinion polls are literally snapshots of public opinion at a particular point in time. When they're misused or they're misrepresented or questions are imbalanced, then of course they're going to be open to criticism which is why we take it so incredibly seriously. And we have a team of people who pour over the questions we ask to ensure that they're balanced, but also we're very careful about how we couch those. And often the research firms themselves will be very careful about how they put those questions into the public domain and the responses. What the media do with them afterwards, of course, is something that needs to be also carefully monitored cool. and how they're being interpreted and spun. But also opinion polls, that is not all we do. In fact, again, opinion polls is only a, a proportion of what our business does now. We use an entirely wide variety of research methods, some of the innovative ones I mentioned earlier, but also, you know, face-to-face, -face, telephone, online research, qualitative research, ethnography. Um, I, I could go on. We, we do a huge amount of it's, different it's, types. There was, um, I'm going I'm to touch on the, the B word now, Brexit. Um, yes. And there was a lot of talk. I mean, there was a fascinating um, expose, if you would call it that. I don't know what, how much it was based in, in truth and reality, with Mr. Cumberbatch playing Mr. Cummings. And there was a lot of focus on focus groups. Yes. And there is, in my, in my understanding now, and again, it's in, in, you know, a, a tiny perception in comparison to your experience of this, but the, the impression I gain is that those certainly in, of, of influence and, in, and with a particular um, political focus are becoming much more attuned to the demographic data, trends, beliefs, directions, and are becoming quite attuned at how they can work with the available media, in, in particular social media, to achieve a particular end. Mm. Just only yesterday, I think there was a release about deterrence um, uh, the piece by Channel 4, which was talking about the way in which the 2016, allegedly the 2016 election of Trump was influenced by his targeting individuals who would potentially vote against him, but were on the borderline, on the cusp of whether they would or wouldn't, so they were targeted not to vote. Yeah, and yeah. It was, it was so granular. Um, I watched that piece um last night i mean it's quite 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 a thing to see what's your view on that use of political i mean it's a, it's a tricky question to put you, but I'm, I'm 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 curious to know your view obviously from your point of view you're looking for truth you're looking for the for, for providing the right answers to people but obviously there is a, there is another side that is trying to uh, you know uh, achieve an objective which is to which is to find themselves in power and are using any means they can to be able to achieve that mm. Yes, so there have been quite a few scandals, mostly in the US, relating to the topic that you've just mentioned. Um, so obviously, as an independent organisation, those kind of contracts where you would be assisting uh, with the kind of analysis which is targeting specific segments of the population with particular messages um, for political gains, those are not the kind of things that we would necessarily seek to engage in. And certainly in the UK, we haven't been doing anything like that also in the US. We do track, um, we do, so we do something called social media analytics, um, and we use social intelligence to have a look at what people are saying online. But we also have the ability now to understand what a bot is doing versus what a real person is doing online as part of our research to help guide our clients. Yeah. Uh, because there is certainly uh, a reasonable amount of bot interference around politics and so you need to be able to get rid of that and to look at the truth and to look at what real people are saying about particular issues. Um, one of the other things of course is the uh, sort of pushing of conspiracy type theory messages which is something we've seen a lot of recently as well and I would say 
um, some of the platforms now are really cracking down on that kind of thing, where yeah. there's a misuse um, of social media to push narratives that are incorrect, not factually based. And that's something that we really welcome as well. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I remember um, the stark difference with, with Obama. I mean, I, I saw it as a positive, and I don't, don't want to be political about this, but the positive way in which he used social media to get his message across. I think he used up was of about 15 different social media platforms in comparison to his um, opponent who really was, was just at the starting gate of trying to think about social media. Mm. And that pretty much helped him in such a way that obviously others have now tried to get alongside it. But of course, it's, it's a minefield. And, and yeah. you should talk about the bots. I think Gary Nicker tweeted this morning, I think he's got rid of 200 bots. <laughs> well done. Yes. Yeah. No, it's I, a, it's I, I, sent him, I sent him a GIF of Space Invaders. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit <laughs> like that. It is. And you do have to be really careful because um, so we do we use social media analytics alongside polling data, qualitative research in order to look at. So a single issue you can look at through lots of different methods. But when you're using that social media, you cannot take it as given in the same way you wouldn't take a poll result as given. And you still want to look at what kind of biases individuals are exposed to when you look at what they say to a particular response. You can't just take the uh, social intelligence stuff as given too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the immediate future, um, for research, you talked about things like drones, which I'm fascinated about. Oh Rolls God, yes, yeah. my colleagues in the US have um, came up with that one. Are, are you involved in any of that work? Do you do you get involved in, in any of the US? Are you going to be involved in any of sort of like Trump, Biden? Um... No, no, I will not. I will let them. We had our election last year. I didn't sleep for a week, so I was very glad <laughs> yeah, that we got a we were the most accurate pollster in the UK. I'm very proud of our team for that. They did a fantastic job. Excellent. But no, we will not take on the burden of the US election as well. And actually, you. it's it's really important that the team who are grounded in US politics look at that and they are looking at all different evidence streams they're not just looking at the polling data um, and they're looking at it in lots of different ways i'll get them to come and do a presentation for our clients in the uk because the outcome of that american election will be of interest to people in every country oh, around the world yeah. and so uh, we're very interested in what they're doing and we will definitely have them over to present in a month's time tell us what the answer will be i hope I bet. And, and that sort of sharing of intelligence and, and of, of evolving nature of what mm. we do. Is there, are there things that you're learning from the opinion poll work, which is, a, which is maybe a small percentage, but obviously at the cutting edge of an awful lot of what we're talking about here in terms of demographics, that you can then move across into the, the other commercial world in which you, you operate and which forms a large part of the business? So, um... So the, the public affairs business, which is the bit I'm accountable for, is made up with around 20% large, big uh, random probability studies, the likes that are national statistics studies on sports participation, volunteering, um, availability of childcare. There's lots of massive studies that uh, are national statistics. Around 20% is big international studies for the World Bank, International Finance Committee, European Union Department still, uh, Director Generals. Um, and then there is 60%, which is other stuff, which is policy, advice, research, insight, which utilizes a whole range of methods. Opinion polling itself, maybe, maybe around 10%, but really high profile normally. Numbers get headlines. So no matter how many focus groups you do, the numbers are going to get the headlines. What is starting to be really powerful, actually, is the use of, use of ethnography research. Yeah. where you can showcase strength of feeling, sentiment, and the depth of the issues for people by having real people explain it on a camera next to numbers, because otherwise some of the qualitative research, it, it struggles to have the same sort of press impact. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. So can you give an example of the use of that? Well, I have a piece coming up, but I can't talk about it. So I'm trying to think of something more relevant. We're doing a piece at the moment. Yeah, it's super exciting, but I... Um, I'll mention something about it later, perhaps, but um, a piece that we're, we're just doing ourselves now, um, which is looking at the impact of COVID-19 around the world, and that is ethnography footage, which we are, we're trailing, um, yeah. and it will come out as a full video piece, but it looks at the impact of lockdown in places like Italy, but then also it's, it zooms across and you can have a look at what's happening in Canada, and you can see the impact of different types of government measures at different times in different yeah. cultures and societies, and the impact on their family 
And no matter how many word reports you write about that, how many 50 page reports you write about how different types of government intervention at different times created different outcomes for the populace and how they really felt about that, nothing gets that message across as well as a lady explaining to you about oh, yeah. how her son's been at home with her now for two months and she's crying her eyes out because she just can't cope. Powerful stuff. I mean, for sure. I think that's that's really interesting innovation. But it, it's using sort of long-held technology and, and, and methodology, but yeah. it's applying it to 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 that medium. I think it's really powerful. Mm. What um, going back in, in, into your experience to date, what would you say has been the project or the work that gave you the greatest buzz? What's 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 been a highlight? Yeah, well, there've been two. The one that I can't say huge amounts about, which was actually an is a piece that we're doing with the Royal Foundation. Um, and that is a piece, uh, Kate, um, sorry, Catherine, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge is very, uh, very much behind the importance of early years and how that's really important for shaping the health and happiness of young people as they grow up through lives. Yeah. Um, and we've been working with her and her team on a really fantastic piece, which brings together lots of different research strands uh, to really understand how much importance public in the UK uh, place on the early years and where, where the support is needed. And so we launched something called the Five Big Questions with her in January last year. Um, and I've had the opportunity to meet her now on a few occasions. And that has been an absolute delight because she is an incredible human, absolutely incredible, um, yeah. and really uh, cares a great deal about the causes that she fights for and that she sheds lights on. So um, I think that's been fantastic. There was a a picture of myself and her in Hello Magazine, and yeah. next, to it, next to it it said Kate's new project, and it just looked like I was her new project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that oh, was good fun. That one was brilliant, and it's still it's ongoing. We will do something with her at the back end of this year um, to showcase it, and then uh, also a piece with the government that we're doing at the minute. And I think the work we're doing with them on. Um, understanding levels of prevalence of virus and also prevalence of antibodies. This has started at the back end of April and we had managed to stand up a massive study. You know, we study, we do 150,000 home tests with the general public, the swab tests in their homes and the same number and more now of antibody tests in home every month uh, over a two week window. That is just the sheer scale of that is absolutely phenomenal. And the, the, the team that worked on it, it was, there was no sleep. There was no sleep. There were, there were very strong, um, you know, the ministers were all over it. They really wanted it to be a success. They wanted it off the ground. And the pressure uh, for that was immense. Um, there were times when it was very overwhelming. But actually, now it's also one of the things that I'm most proud of our team for managing to get off the ground. And it has been delivering incredible data um, it delivered the data just um, at the early stages in September. Um, some of that data when you started to see the virus prevalence rise again in the community. And it fed in with other sources, of course, to help government shape what was needed to, what the sort of trajectory that we needed to start on with some of the, the measures like the rule of six, etc. So it's been very impactful um, and very important, but also one of the biggest challenges in my uh, working career. I mean, you, you can't get bigger than the life and death situations that we're facing no. now to be at the heart of that and making a difference. Yeah. Um, well, it's no, very, very proud of it. It is a, uh, it feels like so. a privilege, a privilege to be able to do it actually. And to have the infrastructure that we could have stood that up in such a short space of time. Very few organizations could have. Fabulous. Who would you say has perhaps provided the greatest influence and motivation for you in your career so far? Goodness me. Um, lots of people for lots of different things, I, I would say, if I was being... Um, Hard to uh, single anybody out. Yeah, well, no, lots of people for lots of different things. Some people are incredible technically, and I would really look up to them for their technical skills. And some people have just taught me to be more, more empathetic as a human, which is not my natural tendency. Um, so, and I think the, the balance of the sort of real technical... A lot of the people I would look up to technically are now in their... Their later years and really into their retirement stages now and I bring them back as advisors on some of our contracts because it's just a privilege to work with them um, and then on the um, just some really influential managers that I have had and again that manager relationship um, so the person my predecessor 
for this role. Um, the person who did it before me is a, a gentleman called uh, Professor Bobby Duffy, who's at King's Policy Institute now. And he was absolutely fantastic at making me a more personable human, despite me not really wanting to be a more personable human. That's very honest of you. <laughs> yes. I know, I'm all honest, David. So it's, I mean, it's, it's that whole um, IQ, which clearly is a given, given that where you are and what you're doing and what you're in charge of. But then there's the all important EQ, mm. which, which we're still, I think we're still debating, which I'm not sure we really should be, because I, I see that as equal importance. It's and absolutely critical. It's more important, especially when you're in a managerial position. Yeah. But that's yeah, that's where you think you've, been, you've had some help in terms of identifying. Yeah. I, th I think that is where leadership of organizations often falls down, where you have a technical leader who's been promoted for their technical capability and skills, when actually it flips when you reach a certain level and what you need more of is definitely the EQ. Um, you should hire people for their IQ, um, but you need to have the uh, emotional ability to and the empathy to manage and understand and care about a large group of people without draining yourself too much. Quite right. I mean, I've, I've, and I've, I've seen it so many times as well, in both in the role of CEO, but also in my interim work now as well, when you go into an organization, how, and, it, and it's, a, it's a common theme that keeps popping up in these podcasts, actually, and, and it's listening. Mm. The yeah. ability to be able to listen to somebody, but really hear them, as opposed to going through the motions, um, and, and having that empathy, which you, you touched on there, which is, which is, which is so true. And mm. um, finally, if you could provide one piece of advice for our, our listeners in relation to their careers, perhaps managing people or managing organizations, what, what would it be? Oh goodness, that's a very big question. It's a very big question. Um, so there's one thing that we're working on at the minute, which is really important actually, which is improving the general levels of resilience in our workforce. Um, there have been lots of conversations uh, in press, media, and amongst you know boards and companies all around the UK around mental health, well-being, uh, work-life balance, um, you know, all of the stuff that companies want to be able to do. But ultimately, they're being like organisations like ourselves, where you're being paid for your time and for your staff's time, and it's very difficult to balance that with fantastic work-life balances where you have client demand. Um, and we really need a very resilient workforce, actually. And so I think my advice would be to work on your own resilience as best you can and lead by example by showing others how they can work on their resilience. You cannot lead a team of people and try to get them to be resilient when you yourself never take a break, never have any downtime, and are visibly seen to not do those things as well. Um, so I think resilience and somehow build it and show others how to do the same. Very good answer. I wouldn't have expected anything else. That's, that's, I, 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 do, I mean, right now that is that is on point for me because we've got so many organisations who are finding it difficult to convey difficult messages, but also to bring people back into a situation where some have been mm. furloughed, some have been constantly working through. So it's it, there's a different type of resilience, and yes. people don't understand that. There's the resilience of the people. Some people will think if you've been employed all the way through this, when you're the lucky one. And without considering the fact they might well have been working two or three different parts of the job that they hadn't yes. previously been doing. So they're absolutely knackered, for want of a better phrase. Uh, and then the people who've been on furlough have just been worried about, do I have a job? Yeah. Kelly, that's been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your information, your, your, your time with us today, but also your insights into the world in which you, you inhabit right now, which is so critical to finding a way through this and actually coming through the other end and being safe and healthy so thank you very much for your time uh wishing you well my pleasure we'll david have you back at some point in the future no worries my pleasure take care thanks for having me